Uh, so, First Corinthians, as we dig in uh, this book that was written uh, during Paul's time while he was still at Ephesus, uh, probably around 59, 60 A.D., uh, but in this time, as he speaks to the church, ministers to them, uh, just to, on their conduct, on all the things that are going on, certainly a, a lot of things happening at this church, not many of them good, but certainly a lot of things happening uh, in like Paul does. Uh, the first few chapters will be about what's going on there. Uh, in the next few chapters, the uh, just the application of it. Uh, but uh, he starts out and he says, Paul called to be an apostle. And if you notice in your Bibles, uh, if they're King James, that they're, the to be is in italics. So really the meaning of it should be Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. So Sosthenes is there with uh, Paul ministering uh, in the Sosthenes we had seen as we went through the book of Acts, uh, but in that place where uh, <laughs> uh, there was trouble. So if you go back to Acts chapter 18, if you would, uh, just so we can take a look at this guy and, and bring to remembrance what happened there. Uh, but just, a, uh, just a, a great thing that did happen in his life. It didn't come about the way that we would think, but it certainly came about. <laughs> uh, but it says in Acts chapter 18, in uh, uh, just for time's sake, uh, there was uh, some things that were going on uh, in down in verse 12 uh, of chapter 18. It says, when Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law <laughs> amazing and when paul was now about to open his mouth in his defense of course galileo said unto the jews if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness or ye, oh ye jews reason would i would that i should bear with you but if it be a question of words and names and of your law look ye to it for i will be no judge of such matters so this, this ruler <laughs> uh, just kind of drives them out and it says he drove them from the judgment seat then all the greeks took sosthenes the chief ruler of the sy synagogue so here's this man he's the chief ruler of the synagogue they grab him uh, not nicely either. It wasn't the right hand of fellowship. <laughs> uh, they grabbed him and they beat him before the judgment seat. So they're there just having a riot in the courtroom. Isn't that great? Sounds like America. Uh, and Galileo cared for none of those things. So here's this man who is beaten up. Uh, he's the chief ruler of the synagogue. He's heading up the Jews. He's bringing this accusation against Paul. And now in 1 Corinthians, as we see him, he's standing with Paul. <laughs> and isn't that just like you and I? I? I think about this once in a while, that sometimes I need those religious things beat out of me just so that I can see what they are and what they're there for, that they aren't really what they were all cracked up to be, that they weren't all that, that were ministered to. And sometimes we hold on to these religious things, and we do everything religiously, don't we? <laughs> we read our Bibles religiously. We have our coffee in the morning religiously. Uh, we do all those things in order uh, because that's what we do, and the older we get, the more we stand by them. But sometimes the Lord shakes those things up on us uh, just to show us that they're just a religious activity and there's really no God in it. Even our reading can become religious instead of relational. Uh, and sometimes the Lord will shake us up with that just so that we can see what we're doing it and why we're doing it. Uh, and just to shake us up and just to show us that, that we might walk in the right way then. But sometimes we have to have those things beat out of us just so that we can see, maybe I really don't need this this way. Or maybe it isn't supposed to be like it is. Remember uh, Peter and the apostles after Judas was killed and Jesus was gone, uh, and they were voting to see who was going to be the next apostle to take his place. 
because uh, it was scriptural. They even used scripture to back it up from from Psalms. You know, the, the bishopric, they needed to vote into office this person. And so they said, well, it's either got to be A or B. <laughs> and the Lord's sitting there going, I vote for C. Because <laughs> he had Paul in the wings, and they weren't even thinking of Paul. They probably knew about Paul, but weren't even thinking of him. But the Lord was. And so they picked the man, but it wasn't the one that God had. And we really don't hear anything about him. Even in tradition, there's not much about him. Uh, But there certainly is a lot about Paul. In here it says that the Lord called him to be an apostle. He called him an apostle. Not to be because God already made it. He already made him to be an apostle. Uh, And just... So wonderful to see that God's ways aren't our, always our ways. And sometimes we have to get beat up to, just to see that, oh, that isn't the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's supposed to be. Lord, your ways are so much different than ours. So uh, help us not to be so settled in some things that, that don't matter about salvation, that we we can't be shaken up and moved and uh, have our ideas changed to another thing. Uh, so he goes on here in verse 2 of, of chapter 1. He says, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. So we see the church, but but the church of God is all around. But this just happens to be the place that the church was. It wasn't the Corinthian church. It was God's church. It just happened to be at Corinth. This isn't God's church at Macedon. This just happens to be God's church that is at Macedon. (laughs) This is God's church. This is not my church. It's not your church. This is God's church. It just happens to be here. And if he decides to move it someday, that's great, as long as it's upward. (laughs) Uh, Let's go with it. So, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ, to those that know their sanctification, they're being set apart, they're being changed, and they're, it's being done in Christ, and they're called, and again, the same words are here, called to be, but the two be's in italics, so we're called saints, and we are the saints. You don't have to get voted on for sainthood. God already voted, and if he's voted, there's no other addition that needs to come with it. We're saints. <laughs> I don't know if I'd walk around saying, well, I'm Saint Jeff now, so... I I can do whatever I want. I I don't know if that would go over too well, but I don't know if Marianne would call you St. Jeff, but we'll work on that later. Never mind. Uh, (laughs) I just started a whole... (laughs) If they get up and leave right now, just don't worry. Just pray for them. Uh, Call to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you in peace. And again, Paul always starts his letter like this, except when it's the uh, pastoral epistles. Uh, And then he adds mercy because he knows pastors need mercy. Uh, But grace be unto you in peace. And always in that order. Because if you don't know the grace of God, you can't know the peace of God. You have to know the grace of God to be able to know the peace of God. The peace that's from God and the peace that is of God. So grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf. And look at what he thanks him for. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ Jesus. And that's the only thing that he thanks them, thanks the Lord for about the church. <laughs> he doesn't thank them for their faithfulness. He doesn't thank them, thank the Lord for, for all that they've done, for all the thank, contributions that they made. He thanks the Lord because the Lord is having grace in the church. Because <laughs> the church is a mess. And I thank the Lord for, on my behalf for the grace that he's given me because my life was a mess until he started straightening me out. Uh, but it's, it's just so so wonderful. Paul finds something to be thankful for about the church. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, you just I, I thank the Lord on your behalf for the grace that he's given you in Christ. Amen. <laughs> that is great. That in everything you are enriched by him, in everything that's going on, you're enriched by him. Look at the grace that God pours out on a church that doesn't even look like a good church. If we saw this church and we entered into it, we probably wouldn't stay long. 
And yet God's hand is on those people. God is ministering to those people. And he's going to bring change there. He's going to bring life to them. He says he's enriched you uh, in everything that goes on in that church. He's enriched them. He's the one that's given them the riches that they have in all utterance. Everything that's said, everything that goes on, he's given it. And in all knowledge. So these three things that he does, that he says about them here in this verse, uh, is all come from the Lord. They're enriched. They have the riches of God poured out to them. They have all the, the utterance, all the words that are being spoken and the knowledge that they have, God has given to them. All three of those things the Lord ministered to this church and has given them. A church that doesn't even look like a good church. A church that's a mess. And we look around sometimes and go, boy, I can't sit next to those people anymore. They're a mess. And so we move our chairs. The only time we ever change our seats is when somebody else sits next to us that we can't take anymore. And so we move to the other side of the church. (laughs) Trouble is, there's people on the other side of the church that are just as much of a mess as the people on this side of the church. So it doesn't matter where you move. People are a mess until God gets a hold of them. And when God starts ministering, and that's why we need to let God take control of our lives and take a hold of us, because we're a mess, and we need straightening out, and we need help. We need to be enriched by Him. We need to know that grace and that mercy and that love and that peace that only He can bring, because that's the only thing that's going to change us is Jesus. And so he, He just thanks the Lord for them and the things that they have, And he says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He pours out on this church that's a mess every spiritual gift that there is. Why? They're abusing it. During communion, they're getting drunk. (laughs) Isn't that great? The the deacons and the elders that are supposed to be passing out communion and getting it ready, they're getting drunk on the wine. (laughs) And before the church service even starts, they're all loaded. They're all in the bag, and they're all in the back sleeping. It's just, what is going on here? They have fellowship dinners, and some of them come early just so that they can eat the food. And when others come, there's no food left. Just, ah, what is going on here? And yet God pours out. All this grace, there's no spiritual gift that he hasn't poured out to this church. Just trying to draw them, trying to give them. And can you think of other churches that are there that are just going, why, Lord, do they have all the gifts? We don't even have half the gifts. And yet we're following your word diligently. We're we're walking in truth. Sometimes I think he pours out more grace because he realizes the people he's dealing with need more grace than others. We can't complain because of what God is doing in another church. We're there to be thankful for it. That God, you haven't given up on them. You love them, and you're just desiring for them to come to the truth and walk orderly before you. Oh, what a sweetness of our Lord that there is. Uh, He doesn't give up on anybody, and aren't you thankful for that? (laughs) If he's not going to give up on them, he's not going to give up on us. And he says, The Lord, who also shall confirm you unto the end, he's going to guarantee you, he's going to get you there, he's going to establish it. That's what the word confirm means. It just means he's going to get them to the end, and he's going to get them there well. And just to be able to hear that, that's got to be such an encouragement to those in the church that are really trying, that are really seeking, that are really hoping that something will happen. And just, oh, And we even think of our own families. And you think, Lord, are you going to get them to the end? We look at America and the whole. We go, Lord, what's going to happen to America to the end? And we see some of the churches and some of the things that are going on. And yet God seems to be not chastising them like we want him to. We want you to get rid of them, Lord. We want you to start over. (laughs) He says, I'm taking care of them. You worry about you. I have enough trouble with you. I I don't need you worrying about them (laughs) to add to your list. I need you to worry about you and where you are in your relationship with me. 
He's going to confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless. And as you read through all the things that are going on in the church, and then you read that God is going to get them there blameless, without blame, without any accusation coming against them when they look so horrible, you know, only God can do that work. The church can't do the work, it's evident. (laughs) The building can't do the work, that's evident. The only thing that's going to be able to work, Lord, it's you your spirit in them. And he says, how are you going to get them there? And he answers that in verse 9, because God is faithful. The same way he's going to get you and I to the end is the same way he's going to get them to the end because he's faithful that's promised. He's faithful and true. God is faithful by whom you were called under the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And and you're going to see uh, Jesus Christ our Lord six times in the first ten verses. And and it's something that, that as we look at, you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord is his title. His name is Jesus, Savior, and his mission is that he's the Messiah. He's the Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. His title, his name, his mission. He's coming to do all these things in the world and for the world. He said, now I beseech you, brethren, as he goes on here in in chapter 1. So he's talking to the church. He even calls them brethren. (laughs) Uh, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, there it is again, that you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. Uh, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. I come to you and I cry out to you and I ask that there wouldn't be divisions in the church there, that there's something going on. And in, in what it is is in verse 11, he tells them what's what's happened. He says, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren. Uh, again, he calls them the church, the brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. (laughs) Uh, And that word declared means that there's been a careful noting of the things that have been going on. She didn't just write and say the church is a mess. Help. (laughs) She she dictates to Paul. She declares to Paul uh, with careful notation of the things that were going on. She's crying out. And I don't think in that sense of just being a tattletale on the things that were going on in the church, but just concerned about the church, concerned about the welfare of the church, concerned about the heart of the church, and concerned because it wasn't representing God well. Her heart is after the things of the Lord. And she cries out to Paul, Paul, you're an overseer, you're an apostle, you're in this area. You're ministering to the Gentiles. Please help. We note in, in Acts that there was twice that, that Paul was at the church at Corinth. Uh, and so she, she probably knows him from, from being there, that he's concerned about the people. And she just wants him to help with the condition of the church. And, oh, I don't think it was malicious. I think it was just her heart crying out. Because things are out of order, please help, knowing that Paul would. And isn't it great when we can cry out to those around us who care about the same things that we care about, that there wouldn't be divisions, that there would be wholeness in the church, there would be a purity in the church, and that there would be a strengthening of the church. And she cries out for that for Paul. He says, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and he starts out now just telling them what, what he's been hearing and what's been uh, brought to his attention. <laughs> uh, he, that there's division, there's contentions, there's all those things that are going on. Uh, in really the, the wording uh, in, in verse 10, as we go through it now and see, is that the, the nets are torn and they need mending. Because if the nets are torn, there's going to be no capture of the fish. There's going to be no encouragement. There's going to be nothing going on because everything is slipping through the nets. Everything that should have been caught and taken care of has just slipped through, and things need to be mended. Things need to be taken care of. And, boy, you look at this and go, man, what a church. But then you look at your own life and go, Lord, 
what's slipping through my life because I've got a hole that needs to be mended. I've got a rupture in my heart that needs to be taken care of. I've got a disease of bitterness in my life that just needs to be taken out and worked on and in that hole mended up so that I wouldn't have that so I, that I can represent you well. And we always look at it and go, wow, look at this church and look at that. But the application certainly has to be for us first and then for the body that we're in and certainly for the body in America and for the church of the whole world. We see the destruction that's going on. And, Lord, what needs to be mended in me so that I could have a right heart? <clears throat> now this I say that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. <laughs> and we see that there's a danger in that. Because we don't follow a man. We don't follow an apostle. We, we don't follow a teacher. But there's certainly a danger with those that are there, and you can almost hear the insinuation that's coming through. And there's some that are saying, well, I'm of Paul because he's a great teacher and he's a great orator and he, he's he got everything in order and he's got everything lined up and he's got points A, B, C, and D and he's got them listed and he's got them going down through and he's great. And Apollos is there. Well, I'm of Apollos because I like him as a teacher better than I like Paul because Paul's got a crooked nose and he's got weepy eyes and, and he looks horrible and he's probably bald and you know, just oh, can't handle that. Apollos has got this beautiful head of hair and he's doing this and he's got great stories that he tells and he's doing all of this. I'm of Cephas. Paul, Peter's a bozo, and I love him because I'm just like him, and, and if he can bungle his way through, then I can too, and, and I, I'd rather hear Peter because he's fiery, and he gets going, and he starts pounding on the pulpit, and he starts shouting, and he's like Ken Graves. He's got a voice that's about 40 octaves lower than anybody else's. Hey, what are you guys doing out there? And, and you know, he's got all these things going on. Well, I, I like that because that wakes me up, and it keeps me awake in church, and I don't fall asleep like this monotone Billy that's up here and he just doesn't do anything I like that and then there's those over in the corner that are just well you guys can have all of them but I follow Jesus you can almost hear the arrogance coming out of that I'm a Paul I'm a Cephas I'm a, I, I'm a, of Apollos well I'm of Christ just oh. and the church is a mess and it's great to say I'm of Christ and that should be what we say, I follow Jesus, but I also act like Jesus. I don't follow him just so that I can say, I've got Jesus. We follow him because we've been humbled and realized that we need Jesus. And I want to act like him. And the arrogancy just comes right out of that and just dissipates and goes. And so he says, first thing, is Christ divided then? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? <laughs> I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, and we read about them in, in, in the book of Acts 2, lest any should say that, that I had baptized in mine own name. He says, if it was up to you guys, you would be going in that place where you'd be saying all these things about me, and it wouldn't be right. And it says this in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Starting at verse 1, he says, I therefore, uh, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, that there is one body and one Spirit even as you are called in one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And he says, but unto every one of us is given grace. There's that grace again. We need to know the grace of God so that we can then go to the peace of God. It says it comes in unity. It comes in that place where there's unity because Christ is one. And if we're in him and he's in us, then there should be one mindset, one glory, one baptism, one Lord, one Savior, one one person that we look to in the church. Not many, but one. 
You know, so he starts out with the church, you're divided. Let's start mending those nets. Let's start healing those divisions. Let's start ministering in a place where, where there, there's challenges, but there's good things that come out of it because there's growth and there's maturity that starts working. You know, we want that in our own lives, and we certainly want that for, for the body of Christ in general. You look at the body of Christ, and we were listening to Joe uh, Foch on, on Sunday, and uh, he was talking about the when he did a conference over in Israel with a hundred Palestine and Jewish pastors of churches. They're in those areas that are now all torn apart because of what's gone on. And they weren't Arab, and they weren't Jews. They were Christians. And, and it just hit me because we're, we're in Corinthians now, just one Lord, one Savior. Doesn't matter the culture, doesn't matter the mindset that you come from. There's one Lord, and we submit to Him, and just crying out and just hearing the pain that they're going through, and certainly keep them in prayer. You know, there's still 136 hostages, and from what we're starting to hear from the hostages that have come out, the awful stuff that they have gone through, and the reports are getting worse all the time. They're they're too graphic to even talk about. They're so awful. I can't imagine what these 136 are going through, that almost all of them to a T have to have counseling of some time kind when they come out because of the torture, the abuse that they've gone through, that they've seen that happened while they were in captivity is just overwhelming for the natural mind to handle, and they're struggling. Oh, Lord, why is the enemy winning? But like, then, like the psalmist says, then I see their end, and I know what's going to happen to them, and pray for salvation for them, for the kidnappers, salvation for the hostages, salvation for those that are in the midst trying to work all these details out, but certainly hearts that need to be mended, maybe more than yours and in mine. But every heart needs mending. Every heart needs tending to. And Lord, please be the one that does that for them that they would know you in this. As he cries out for the church here at Corinth, he says there's division there and it needs mending, it needs taken care of, and whatever things that we're divided in, whatever things that our hearts have have, have taken place in our hearts that, that need mending and tending to, that we would allow the Lord to do that, that there wouldn't be a division there, that there wouldn't be a separation between us and the Lord because of something that happened years ago. Because of things that have taken place, Lord, please heal my heart and bring it to a place where I can see you as you are, for who you are, for your glory, that I could be changed. Because I don't want to be like I used to be. I don't even want to be like I am now. I want to be changed. And Lord, you're the only one that can do that. It's not Paul that could do it. It's not Apollos that could do it. It's not Cephas that could do it. It's only Jesus. There's unity in that name. He says, I, I baptized Crispus and Gaius, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I didn't come here to baptize. I came here to preach. He says that in verse uh, 17. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. I'm here to give out the gospel, not with wisdoms of words, even though he could, an educated man, probably more educated than any of the people he was ministering to, Not in wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. I don't want to do it with words to show people how smart I am. I want to do it so that they can see the cross of Jesus. I don't want to argue them into the kingdom. I want them to make a decision for Christ on their own. But they need to see the cross to be able to do that. They need to realize what the cross was about. That it wasn't just an instrument of death. It was an instrument that brought life to you and I, because of who was on it. The cross did nothing, but Christ did everything. And he's the one that can bring healing for our hearts and healing in our ways, healing in what we're going through, healing for all those things that have been going on. He says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It's foolish stuff. It says this in in the next chapter in verse 5. It says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Don't let your faith stand 
in what the wisdom of men say, but let your faith be in what the power of God is. Oh. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish its foolishness. And didn't it sound foolish to you and I before we got saved? What do I need to, to read the Bible for? The Bible's for learned men. The Bible's for the pastors and the teachers and the priests. The Bible isn't for common people. We don't need to read it. All we need to do is just go and give our money and we're okay. <laughs> the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. And don't you know that? Down deep you know that because of the power of the cross, the power of God showing us the cross, that, that it has really brought us to a place where we can realize that we're saved where that we can realize that it's true and that it's real. It just brings us to that place. Unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. God, your word is powerful. It's like a two-edged sword, isn't it? Cutting between the bone and the marrow, cutting to the very depths of our lives and showing us our need for him and his love for us. As it cuts in to show us what sin is, it cuts in to show us what real love is. When we thought we had it all figured out as teenagers. Remember when you were teenagers? I know it's a long time ago, but think really hard. <laughs> you knew everything. Your parents were the dummies. You knew everything. I got it all together. When I get older, this is what I'm going to do. And then you got older and you realized, I don't have a clue anything that I'm doing. Can I go back and live at home? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't as dumb as I thought they were. Oh, but when he comes in and does a work in our lives, we see the power that God has just in a word. In a word. Because the word is Jesus. He's the living word. And his word is alive. All our words are just words that are dead, without any meaning, without any hope, without anything. But his word is alive. And it works. And it's come alive to, to you and I because he's come to save us. And because it's alive, he brings life with it. Life that we never had before outside of him, we now have because of him. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the word that's alive. And it's your power, the preaching of the cross, the living word, the preaching of those living words is to us, it's the power of God. We see the power in it. We see the power through it. And we should read it as such. When we sit down to do our readings, it's not so that we can get another sermon. It's not so that we can get another verse to, to clobber the unbelievers with. It's so that our hearts can get changed because the word that we're seeing does a work in our heart and changes us. Lord, I'm an idiot, but now I'm a saved idiot. But I'm getting better. <laughs> I'm on the right side now. Now, Lord, make it so that my words will be your words, so that they'll be sweet, so that they can see your power. Because there's men who are wonderful preachers, that are great teachers, that have no idea who Jesus is, but they use powerful words because they have, they have a grasp of the language. They have a grasp of how to use it. They have a grasp on how to motivate people to believe things and how to do things, but they have no idea who Jesus is. But when God's anointing is on his word, which is what your Bibles do, it changes lives. You may get motivated by words to do things. That's why there's protests. That's why there's yellings and screamings. But Jesus didn't have to scream. He didn't even have to raise his voice, it says in Scripture. And what does it say about God's word? It comes with a still, small voice. It doesn't have to scream it. it doesn't have to shout it doesn't have to use it to motivate you into doing something. It gives life to you, and you do it because of it, because you love it, because you want it. Not because it motivates, but because it gives you love that you want to do it. Oh, may we read it like that and have that heart that would want to change every time we sit down to read it. He says in verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And this is from Isaiah 29. Uh, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. All those things will just go by the wayside. 
but there's one thing that is going to stand, and we know it's his word. And he goes on here in verse 20, and he says, uh, Where is the wise and where is the scribe? <laughs> where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? All the wisdom that comes out of this world is just foolishness. And you and I are starting to tell that by the debates that keep going on, the presidential debates. All they do is kill each other. I mean, we can do that. you got the games at the arcade. You know, the thing pops out of the hole and you take the mallet and you smack it. That's all they're doing. They're just smacking each other. You popped out of the hole, poof, I'll put you back down. I got better words than you got words. I can shout louder than you can shout. Uh, it's just amazing, and it's foolish. They think themselves to be wise, and it's just foolishness. Uh, where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where are those people when your heart needs mending, when your heart needs healing? They're too busy yelling and screaming. They're too busy getting power to help those that are hurting. There's only one that does that, and it's Jesus. He says in verse 21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, and it pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. <laughs> preaching is foolishness. <laughs> it, it's amazing. It's, it's foolishness because to the world it is foolish. You believe in a God that you can't see? You believe in a God that you can't hear? And you almost scratch your head because they're sitting there believing in a God that's killing them. And they're thinking it's wise. You go to church, not just on Sunday. You go twice a week. You are really foolish people. They really got you hoodwinked. They really got you in a place where you're believing. You must be in a cult. <laughs> Amazing. Because it doesn't look like what we think it should look like, so it's got to be foolishness. But as we walk by faith... We walk in that place where we believe the things that we can't see because the Spirit of God has shown us that they're real, that they're true, and he confirms it to our heart that this is the real world, not what you live in, but heaven is the real place where there's real life, and it's not foolish. Oh, the preaching to save them that believe becomes then the power of God in a person's life. Oh. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And isn't it amazing as you look through, when you see people that are led by signs and wonders, like Satan is going to give out in Revelation, everybody's going to follow it because the signs and wonders are there. Everything that they've been looking to. And what did Jesus say? You're looking for signs and wonders. Isn't that what it says here? The Jews are looking for signs. But if you get a sign, if you get a miracle, you need more miracles to believe because miracles don't save you. Miracles don't do anything for your life but make you want more miracles and more signs and more wonders. And you just keep going. And that's why there's churches that are teaching that there's now gold flakes floating down out of heaven, falling upon people's heads that, that are anointed of God. Really? <clears throat> Because they're looking after signs and wonders and not after the truth. They want signs and wonders. They want to get encouraged. They, they, they want to get excited about the things of the Lord. So you've got to have faith in faith. It says, no, you have faith in Jesus. <laughs> and the Greeks look after wisdom. They want more wisdom. And what did they say about Paul when Paul came? Oh, let's hear this guy when he was on Mars Hill, right? Let, let, well, let's listen to this guy. He's got something new, and we need to hear it because we love to hear these new things and might bring more wisdom when all we need is the truth. We don't need to have a new truth because there's only one truth. It doesn't need to be made new or made more relevant to the times that we're in, which is where a lot of people are going now. Well, I need to go to a church that's more relevant. No, you don't. You need to hear the truth. Because this word is more relevant than any new truth will, that it comes out of the world will ever be. We don't need more relevance. We need to get into the word and find out what it says. <laughs> it would be new to us <laughs> because we finally learned what, what the Bible really means. Uh, we don't need new translations. We need the word. 
It, it's amazing to me uh, that uh, the word Lord in the King James is used 84 times in, in the book of Corinthians. In the message, which is a translation, you know how many times the word Lord is used? Zero. Where's the focus? It's not on the Lord. It's on everything but Lord. He doesn't want to be just our Savior. He wants to be our Lord of our everyday life. And boy, when you start putting into practice those things that come about, you start realizing, Lord, I need more of you. <laughs> the other day I was at part of uh, an extension of the VA for, for veterans. I'm trying to get some benefits. And, of course, they can't find anything that I am. I, I really don't exist. They brought up my name and find, found a blank page. <laughs> well, here's my papers. Here's my active duty. Here's all the ships that I was on. Here's all the places that I was. And they said, yep, here's my discharge from the reserves. Yep. How come I got a blank page? Don't know. <laughs> so I go to this place to try and find out. And I'm sitting there and I get in there and I've got an hour uh, before I have to get back somewhere else. And I go, oh, Lord, there's somebody in front of me. I'm never going to make it. And then I look at the guy and the guy's asking questions. And the guy that's sitting next to him that he's supposed to be helping isn't even answering him. And then all of a sudden I realize he's not talking to this guy. He's talking on his phone because he's got the little thingy in his ear, you know, and he's just he's talking to a guy on his phone because he can't get the computer to work. He's not even helping this guy. And I'm going, Lord, I'm never going to make it. So I start praying. <laughs> and all of a sudden he gives up on that computer, goes over to another computer, and the guy comes over and follows him over, and he sits him down, and I start praying again. Lord, he's starting on another computer. And, of course, he can't get this one up either and, and working. And so I start praying some more. And the guy has a question, is this where I'm supposed to send this paper to? He didn't need the computer for that. Will you just help him? <laughs> just start praying again. Lord, I need you in this because I need to get this taken care of. And I need you to get me out of here so that I can get to the other place that I'm supposed to be at on time and not be a bad witness and, and get there and do the things that I need to do. Lord, you need to help me. And he gets the guy out of the way. He says, yeah, that's where you need to send it. And this is what you need to fill in this blank. Because that's why they sent it back to you. Because you didn't fill in this blank. Oh, okay, goodbye. So I get up. I go, this is good. Thank you, Lord. You answered my prayer. And I get up. And I sit down. And the computer's not working. And the guy calls him back. How's the other computer? It's not working. And he starts talking to him. Lord, I start praying again. How much we need him in our everyday life. Not just for a lot of things, not for the big things. Everything. Everything. The worst part was he couldn't help me. <laughs> he said, You gotta go somewhere else. <sighs> really? But this is the service we're talking about. <laughs> the hurry up and wait. You get there and you think, Oh, this is gonna be quick. And it's days, it's millennium before you even get through the line as you stand there. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and I went to Great Lakes in December. You don't want to go to Great Lakes in December for boot camp. It's cold. And what's the first thing they do? You have no hair and you're standing outside. And you have no hair to protect anything. There was no intelligence on my part. There's no intelligence on their part. <laughs> but boy, do we need to pray about everything, not just the big things. Lord, what do you have for me in this? And it wasn't a bad thing. I didn't get what I wanted, but the Lord got done in me what he wanted. He got me praying. Oh, that's all you sent me there for, Lord? I could have saved 20 minutes just by not even bothering. He goes, I know. But I needed you to pray and to see me work. I got to see God work. He moved a guy out of the way. He got the other guy off the phone. He got the other guy not even work, working with a computer because he didn't need it. I just needed a question answered. He couldn't do it. And he finally sent me to the, uh, another place that maybe they could, which I never got a hold of. But, hey, that's another story. But God answered, and I got to see it. It didn't get what I wanted, but it got what he wanted. Lord, help me not to expect anything, but just to see you work. 
and to know your presence. Lord, nothing in this world that's run by the world is going to work, but your ways are always going to work. So help me to trust your ways more than I'm trusting the ways that I'm are in front of me, that I have to go through while I'm here in this world. Help me to still have joy in you in the midst of it. <laughs> Amazing. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But what we preach, Christ crucified under the Jews, a stumbling block, and he did become that stumbling block to them. And under the Greeks, it was foolishness because you believe in something that you can't see. You're holding on to something that, that you think is real that we don't think is real, so it's foolishness to us. But what is foolishness to the world is the power of God in people's lives who trust him. We see the power of God, and they go, you're foolish. Oh, yeah? What power do you see? Hmm. Oh, boy. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, even though the, the Jews without God are seeking a sign, and the Greeks without God are seeking after wisdom, Jews and Greeks who have Christ see the power of God. Ah, see where he brings them? They're still Jews. They're still Greeks. They're different in culture. They're different in name. They're different in location. But they all see the power of God. Because God is at work in this world, and he's still at work. God is still on the throne. Unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He becomes everything that the Jews and Greeks without God were looking for. He becomes everything that they needed and they didn't even know it, it was right in front of them. Oh, just like he was right in front of us, trying to get our attention before we got saved. Everything you're looking for is in me. Nah, can't be it. I got to do something else. Those people are silly. They were ties to church. <laughs> that can't be right. Oh. And he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Amen. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, you see your calling, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. There are some, but there are not many. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. And we all have to raise our hands with that. Who's the foolish ones? Us. <laughs> You're good. You're still listening. That's a good thing. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Don't you realize part of the reason you're here is to confound the wise people? <laughs> Amazing. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And, and the first thing that comes to my mind is David and Goliath. He was there to confound the ones that were mighty. The one that was mighty was Goliath. The foolish thing that they brought before him was this little puny teenage boy probably with acne, just sitting there. He's still probably got sheep stuff hanging off of him as he comes into the thing because he's got no armor on. All he's got is a sling and a stone. And, and Goliath is sitting there with with his 30-pound spear and his armor bearer in front of him and all this armor on. And he's got a deep voice, and he's yelling at people. And David, what are you doing, Goliath? Ooh confounded them to pieces because God had the victory because he saw the power of God. And we see the power of God in those little puny Davids. But boy, what power God gave him and what power God wants to give you and me. He wants to give us his power to stand in the days that we're in. And he goes on in verse 28 and says, In the base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen. Uh, that's us again. That's a Take out those words, put in your name. <laughs> That's us. Yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Isaiah had to have himself killed before he could see the glory of God. He had to die to self before he could see the glory of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, the thing that he was holding on to is being a power and an influence in his life had to die before he saw the power of God. And then he said, I'm undone. I'm finished. I'm toast. And then the Lord came, brought a coal from off the fire, cleansed him, and he was on fire for him. No flesh is going to have glory in front of God. But of, of him ye are in Christ. 
But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The wisdom was there. He was wise to salvation, the righteousness, just showing the forgiveness of sin, the sanctification, the, the, the walk of forgiveness and the redemption the fullness of that salvation. And we get to see all of that, not because of us, but because we've got a God who saved us, because we've got a God who wants to show us his power, his might, and he shows us in all those things, in all those ways of who he is and what we're not. Because as we see who he is, we realize what we're not. And the only way we get that is by submitting to him and allowing him to show us his glory. It's amazing to me is Moses, this great man of God, a man who God says, I spoke with him face to face. You guys I just speak to in visions and dreams, but Moses, I talked with him face to face. Can you imagine? And when Moses said, I want to see your glory, God says, well, let me put you in the cleft of the rock, which of course is Christ. Let me put you in Jesus (laughs) because Jesus is the living rock. Let me put you in Jesus, and my glory will pass by. You can see my hinder parts. And what does it say? The goodness of God passed by. Moses, expecting this glory. just and, and as you read it, you expect all this glorious stuff to be talked about and to be seen. And what does it say? The goodness of God passed by. Moses got to see the tail end of his goodness. Oh, that's it? That's glory? It's glorious if you're God. <laughs> And we get to see the goodness of God because he poured it out on us in the person of Jesus Christ. How much more goodness do you need to see before we submit to the Lord and let him be in us what he wants to be? Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. Lord, there's just so much here to unpack. Uh, More than a lifetime can afford. (laughs) We go through it so quickly, Lord, when there's so much there. But Father, please unpack it for us. Give it to us in those size pieces that we can handle at the moment that we're in right now so that we might see your glory, that we might know the power of God in our life, that we might see the power of God working and doing for us and to us and through us those things that you talk about that we haven't seen till now, walking in your truth, living for you, wanting you to be known in our lives. Help us with this, Lord. It's a work of your spirit. We can't do it. We can't work it up. We can't make it happen. Lord, you allow it to happen for those that are walking after you, submitted to you and given over to you, Lord. So have your way with us. Whatever you need to do to get our attention, whatever you need to do to get us to that place, Lord, of mending us, of tending to us so that we might catch those things. Lord, have it happen so that you'll be glorified so that we can be whole. And we'll thank you for it, Lord, because of your goodness, because of your grace, because of your mercy, and because of who you are. And we just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.